do. Okay. Damn. Oh, and I had a question. Ah, ah, ah. Oh, are we back for more fun? Yay. Oh, we're back. Whichever. You can either choose to have fun or not, you know? You're as happy as you want to be, says Abe Lincoln. And that man suffered from depression, so he knows. Um, <clears throat> I know I've only done two CE thingies. Don't worry about it. You'll get your CE. Um, and somebody right before we broke had a question. If they <coughs> can't get the carrier to add the assisted living endorsement for somebody in a facility, what about an HO4? Well, an HO4 would always work. It's, they created the assisted living endorsement because no companies wanted to do HO4s for people living in assisted living or nursing homes. Um, <coughs> so it's always up to what the company will do or not. And the assisted living endorsement theoretically doesn't apply to the HO91. It was created with the 2000, 2011, but companies can do whatever. Has anybody here used the assisted living endorsement? You know, if people go into assisted living or nursing homes with assets, they might want to think about that from a liability standpoint. Um, and assisted living, you can bring contents. And that's an endorsement you add to your homeowner's policy. But unlike the other members of the household, you, you start off with a smaller limit of contents, like it's 10,000 of contents. If I add you as a, uh, the other member of household endorsement, you just, you're just part of my insured repertoire and you can have the entire coverage see if you needed to. But this starts like, I think with 10,000 of contents and only 100,000 of liability, which normally, if, how much liability y'all sell on a homeowner's policy? 500,000, a million, you know, whichever is available. As far as ISO is concerned, they capped it at 500,000, which would be in PIUA. But a lot of your companies allow up to a million, why not? And then if, you know, when they buy an umbrella, it just starts that much later and goes that much longer because the underlying liability is not that expensive. You know, for a homeowner, auto gets more expensive. But with the assisted living endorsement, that starts at 100,000. So if I have a $500,000 limit on my homeowner's policy for all the normal liability issues, that endorsement doesn't get it. I'd have to, if I want more than 10,000 of contents, ask for more and ask for a higher liability limit. It's, it is kind of like a separate policy attached to my homeowners, but not every company wants to do it. Now, a lot of us don't think about people when they go into the assisted living and certainly not the nursing home, but okay. So. I'll wait a few more minutes before I do a check-in. Don't worry. Okay, where will we? You know, whenever I break for lunch, it's like my mind goes into oblivion. It's like, uh, I'd rather just go straight through, stop early, and be done, isn't that? <laughs> you know, it's why my m mind works. <clears throat> and I always wonder, hey, th this is stupid. They said we're going till 5 o'clock. Well, <laughs> on that, as far as, <laughs> <laughs> far as I'm concerned. Um, <clears throat> Say that oh, I can. <laughs> I didn't swear, I went phooey, um, but uh, I just, uh, anything after 4 o'clock, but I have to go past 4 o'clock, I have to go closer to 4.30, ew, we'll see. So I even, I wasn't sure how long the salt line's going to last, I never know until I do it, but I added more stuff into my PowerPoint presentation just in case. Just in case I run out of things to say and you all don't ask questions. But thank you for you all in video land asking questions, and certainly you people here too. Um, so <clears throat> we had said before we went to lunch that Munchkin has a mass auto policy, has a significant other. That's nice. He or she operates Munchkin's vehicle, got to list them, but that's all. That only works for when driving Munchkin's car. And <clears throat> from a rental contract standpoint, totally separate contract. If Munchkin's going to let significant other or anybody else operate the rental car, you have to tell the rental company. And they're usually not free. And the last time we went to rent a car, I said, oh, list me. And then they said it was, a, you know, 10 bucks a day. I said, never mind. That's, you know, we're renting the car for seven days. That's 70 bucks. If I drove it once or twice, that's not $70 worth to me. I'll just do what I always do. 
sit in the passenger seat and tell my husband how to drive. <laughs> I'm trying to get better about that. That's the only thing that we argue about these days. So, so I, I, I now have a game on my phone that I like, Pyramid Solitaire. So if I just do that and don't look up, I'm all set. Okay, so violations, <coughs> detrimental, and <coughs> when you, the, you do rent a car, you have to do it with a credit card, correct? <coughs> and you've just given them your credit card limit. And they will take it. If you bring that car back broke, not happy little campers are they. And they'll assume about how much it's going to cost and they can reserve that on your credit card and you gave them the right to do that by signing your name and not reading what you said you were going to do. Excuse me? You can get you can get the lost damage waiver that hopefully absolves you of all guilt. Um, people say, should I um, buy the lost damage waiver? Yes. Yeah. My standard answer is, I have no clue what you should do. I really don't know. I don't know. All I know is, I prefer to buy the lost damage waiver. My husband prefers to use his credit card. Lost damage waiver, <clears throat> before I buy it, I ask, does it absolve me of all responsibility? Because if it doesn't, it's next to worthless. Some of them are just collision damage waivers, and all they do is waive your collision deductible. It's like, woo! Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I'm not spending 10 bucks a day to waive my deductible. It's just that, to me, is ridiculous. I want it to, to absolve me of all financial issues should I bring your car back broke. But then if I do that, I have to read the contract because that's what it is. And I can void the contract and all those things just voided the contract. And then I spend X amount of dollars a day and you're taking it. And I can't, you know, and I'm up a creek without a paddle. So I. I say, you know, buy it, but before you do ask, does it absolve me of all responsibilities? And then read the contract. They have <clears throat> generally a driving under the influence. Oh yeah, by any person, if there is a reasonable evidence, they were under the influence of narcotics, intoxicants, or drugs. So, you know, drinking and driving is illegal in every state. But we saw earlier that it's not excluded under my auto policy, correct? But if I bought the lost damage waiver and they find out I was drinking, did I just void the lost damage waiver? And then you have to take it one step further. Did I, did I just lose consent to the owner by doing this? And if I did, does that mean I can't even get back to my mass auto policy? It could. So now you've just thrown more money at a problem and it just became a bigger one. So I don't know if you should buy it, but I sure as shooting know you should read this. Whether you do or don't. Because if you violate the contract, you might have lost consent to the owner, and then you don't even get your rotten little mass auto policy to be there, paying actual cash value, which no rental company accepts, because they all ask something else. But I don't know. I, um, my husband and I disagree over that, and it's like, whatever. We generally don't rent expensive cars, so if we bring it back broke, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. That's the way I look at life. We're not renting Lamborghinis here. So, <clears throat> I don't know. But you authorize them to destroy your card. And I do tell people to look at the car before they leave the lot. And I mean, look at it. I mean, I just, <clears throat> I almost bring a magnifying glass. You know, is that a little scratch or is that just dirt? And then I want you to circle it on that little piece of paper that looks like a car. And then I don't believe in express drop-off either. Because I want a human being signing off that the car came back in the same way it left and they checked the rotten gas because somehow they charged what twelve dollars a gallon you know kind of like another extortion not that I, I i didn't mean that but they certainly charge more than any gas station in the area does and i figure they can't tell the difference between 12 miles of me using a gas of full tank and so, I, I, you know, I want them to check it off. Some busy little people believe in Express. I don't trust anybody. And I tell them that. I say, you see, I work in insurance. And I don't trust you people. 
And they laugh. I said, no, I'm not joking. I don't trust rental companies. So, okay. Um, so, significant other is driving the rental car. They have an she, he or she has an accident. What will Munchkin's personal umbrella policy do? I don't know, but nothing is probably, you know, because if she's not an insured under the underlying auto, which he or she is not, unless he or she is driving Munchkin's car, then I, you know, depending on how it reads, but I, I, I don't see how it could respond. So. There's always a possibility, but I, I, I doubt it. I'd have to see the definition under the personal umbrella. And I really don't, have not read an umbrella that unless you're related to me, that the umbrella will do anything for you unless you're driving my car or maybe in my household or added as an additional insurance on the underlying. Drones! Yay! Um, <clears throat> A lot of people are buying them. Yeah. You know. I mean, they always had them. They were just not called drones years ago. They were just, you know, toy helicopters. Now they're drones. And people do dumb things for the, with them. So, <coughs> significant other bought Munchkin a drone for his birthday. 5000 that's a hefty little amount. And that's not really an expensive one that's going to be of any ilk. Is it covered under the H04 should it get damaged? No. I mean, the homeowner's policy, well, the H03 especially, um, <clears throat> addresses everything I own. And actually, the H04 does. We're just assuming you don't own building, right? Um, <clears throat> but everything I own is addressed in the homeowner's policy. Everything I own either falls under real property or personal property, correct? And then in personal lines, we separate real property into two categories. The dwelling and the other things on the property. Coverage A, dwelling, coverage B, other structures. And then everything else is what? Coverage C, personal property. Personal property really just means movable. That's about what it means. And then under personal property, we start off doing what? Covering everything an insured owns or uses. The world is at your feet. And then, no. <laughs> but we do. We don't take everything away, but. I mean, we, we look at how we, you know, this is not buy one, get one free. So if you have, if an insured has other residences, will we limit the overall value at another residence? Yes. And the HO 2011 decided storage is an ugly thing too, so it limits that. But we've got that overall dollar value limitation, certainly at another residence. Okay. And then we have some special little limitations of coverage just for you. Actually, we call it special limits of liability. That actually sounds good, correct? It should say not so special limitations in coverage. Because the first paragraph covered everything up to the value of it. So I, I always need to go through those categories. Is there a category for aircraft? No. Not in the ISO policy. Is there a category for watercraft? Yeah. Is there a category for trailers? Yeah. But not aircraft, okay. Now, and then after we get that dollar value limitations of certain ca uh, categories of property, and then we get into the property not covered. That means don't worry about the value of it because we ain't paying for it anyways. And do we see aircraft pop up there? Yes, we do. Because airplanes can be very expensive. But in the concept of aircraft, we give back something. So drones end up being covered for the value of the drone. It's just when it comes to covered property, what happened to it? Is it a covered peril? But, you know, drone, unmanned aerial vehicle, or remotely piloted aircraft, we can't just say toy airplane anymore. We're going to have fancy terms for it, but, you know, drones. And HO91, we under property not covered, under covered to aircraft and parts, period. And it used to stop there. 
I think 76. And I can't remember whether it was 84 or 91 that we then added. Aircraft means any contrivance designed or, or used for flight, <gasps> except model or hobby aircraft not used or designed to carry people or cargo. Is that not what a drone is? Or at least that drone, can you fit in it? And it's not designed to carry property. Are there some drones used to carry stuff? Yes. And are there big drones? But even still, they're not, drones as a general rule of thumb are not designed to carry people because that's what an airplane is designed for. Whether it's designed to carry property, that could limit it. But for the most part, the drones people are buying, not designed to carry people or property, therefore covered under their homeowner's policy. Yeah, but a camera, I mean, it's attached to, it's not carrying, not designed. I mean, the concept designed to carry property was, was, was Amazon using or trying, thinking of using drones to deliver packages purchased on Amazon? Yes, they were. Not a good idea. <laughs> I'll do the city, yay. Uh, that would be a problem, but for the most part, the drone people are buying, not designed to carry property. And it says, use, it says use or designed to. So if I'm not using it to carry cargo, it's not excluded. If it's not designed to carry cargo, not excluded, it's covered. Up to the full value, and some of them can get wicked expensive. Oh, that's pretty neat. Um, oop. And the HO 2000 and 2011, covered C. Property not covered, does it in two sentences. Again, we don't cover aircraft, you know, those things used or designed for flight, including. Now, if it stopped there, you'd have a problem. But we do cover model or hobby aircraft not used or designed to carry people or cargo. So, drones are covered under the homeowner's policy. For how much? Well, the value of it up to your covered sea limit. If you have an HL4, what's your covered sea limit and what's the value of it? And that's another thing, you know, how much contents did people buy? Because you can have one item that's, if you only pick 10,000, half of your value. So you might want to rethink that. And I always think the holiday season is a good time to rethink values. Because whether you deal with Hanukkah or Christmas, don't you buy a lot of stuff for people? Spend a lot of money and then they put it in their house. And if they did that year after year, and quite possibly that ten or 15,000 they thought was sufficient really is not. Uh, now, if you use it for business, is that not a special little limitation of coverage just for you? So, under the, it, the homeowner's policy, a drone used for business, you're not going to get $5,000 worth of value because we limit on the residence premises coverage for business property and off the residence premises property. And then from a liability standpoint, if you use it for business, you're going to have a problem. But from a liability standpoint, I remember years ago, and it's why, and I can't remember, it's been so long, whether it was 84 or 91 that they put it in. But prior to that, somebody had a radio remote helicopter and it took a nosedive <laughs> right through somebody's very expensive glass greenhouse. And before we gave back, oh, except the hot, when it just says means any contrivance used or designed for flight, was that a problem? And so the homeowner, you know, got the owner of the drone got sued and the homeowner's policy said, you got a problem. And it was after that that ISO said, oh, it's, you know, we'll put it into the policy. Now they're rethinking that because now are more people buying drones than had them maybe 30 or 40 years ago. But at this point in time, the 91, 2000, or 2011, if it takes a nose down, um, and you're not aiming it at somebody on purpose, then liar B, I, and P, D could happen, could be covered. I met and same mine last year. I'm sitting under the umbrella, and I said, mm -hmm. and then what is that irritating noise? And I look up, there's a drone with a camera. Taking pictures, not of me, because I'm old and you don't need a picture of me. But just, mm, it's like a uh, thinking. <laughs> I know, <laughs> could be, not me. Oh, so, um, so we cover B I or P D H O ninety one, 
And the same thing with HO 2000 and 2011, though it's done differently. HO 2000 and 2011 has more definitions. At the beginning of the policy, we have a definition. Aircraft liability means, hovercraft liability means, motor vehicle liability means, watercraft liability means. And aircraft liability, for the purpose of this definition, aircraft means any contrivance used or designed for flight, oh, except. So since I'm talking about something not designed or used to carry people or property, then the aircraft liability definition means nothing to me, correct? And so therefore, when I see the aircraft liability exclusion, I say, I don't care. Because by definition, it's not what I worry about. So the 91 does it one way, and the HO 2000 or 2011 does it the other way. But either way, you've got contents coverage, you've got liability coverage. So that's a good thing. Hey. Um, business use under the 91, 2000, or 2011, you get a problem. Business use, no matter what the addition is, is limited to 2,500 on the residence premises. It's just uh, 91 is a little bit more stringent, used at any time, in any manner, for any business purpose. Which means if you use it once, it's always limited, which is, you know. The HO 2000, 2011 says primarily use. But if, it's a, if I bought it for my business, and there's a lot of businesses that use drones. Realtors use it, insurance companies use it, um, you know, any uh, auditors use it, or towns, you know, it's easier to go out and look at things, take pictures, aerial views, and decide whether they want to insure you, or so all sorts of businesses use them. Um, excuse me? Well, yeah, well, that's the commercial lines, they don't have the give back for. So the CGL doesn't cover it. And the property policy only covers it when it's on the premises. So, yay. When it's in the air, forget it. Yeah. There are some specialty markets. Yeah. And it would, ha it would have to be a specialty market. Yeah. When you live too close to where they fly airplanes in and out, we're not happy with that at all. There are federal aviation laws, but I was just reading an article that a drone hitting a plane does a lot more damage than a bird hitting a plane. And a bird hitting a plane can do enough damage as it is because it's caused crashes in the past. So, um, and the, you know, so be limited contents, and then off the residence premises, it's either 250, 500, or 1500. So, business drones, limited in contents, and absolutely no liability at all, none. And obviously, you're going to have to search the market for specialty markets. So, um, I just said, I said, drones hitting person, and actually they had some, and I didn't want to. I thought they were a bit graphic of the people's heads that got hit by a drone. So I said, I guess I won't do that. That's a little bit eerie. So I got you know, they, you know, just did a, a little crash dummy. I said, good, we can, we can watch that. We watch that with automobiles all the time. Um, so if you're using it as a weapon, pretty much, that's intentional. Intentional loss is excluded, but accidental. I'm thinking, as, you know, I th when you work in insurance, does it skew the way you look at life? Yes. <laughs> so when I see, I'm on the beach and I'm seeing this drone, I'm, I'm thinking it's going to crash, it's going to hit people, it's going to, you know, it's like, eh. Life was better before I worked in insurance, but I, it's been so long now I can't remember. And I know. Up until I get, got out of college. And even then, in high school and college, I worked part-time. But, so, do people put cameras on drones? And this drone did have a camera on it, but it was there for a kid's birthday, and it was doing aerial pictures of the kid's birthday. And, and then, like, my friend who, when he's got his camera at St. Martin Beach and sees an interesting woman in the topless segment, I'm sure it was taking pictures of that, too, but I don't know. So... If you make things public, I mean, I too, before you post things that have people you don't know in them, aren't you supposed to ask their permission? I mean, really? Well, I mean, from a business standpoint, you sure are shooting on because newspapers are very careful about that, but no, really. And certainly, if you got a camera on yours, could you be flying over and seeing all sorts of things that maybe people behind 
walls or you know fences really don't want to be seen and that's exactly why they put that fence up I mean but people do the darndest things look at that we can buy on everyone yay and privacy can be a problem um, if you have the personal injury endorsement on your policy which you should it has a business exclusion always but you know if it was innocent and then somebody wasn't happy about that, then your policy could respond when they sue you and say, take that down and make sure that nobody ever sees it, all that. Uh, Massachusetts does not have specific drone laws. Some states do. We haven't done that yet, but there's federal laws. And people that have drones really need to know them if they're going to be flying anywhere near where airplanes come and go because generally you probably won't get up high enough once the plane is up there but if you're anywhere near an airstrip you have to you know go by federal code and um no i didn't put it here somewhere where is it up oh, there uh i got this is not in your book but i just found another article for people that do have drones there you know there's a smartphone app they can get and it's before you fly and if they can have it on the phone and then they can look to see if there's anything in the area. This came about because of the wildfires in California. Um, that you get people nosy with the drones plus insurance companies, but that's not nosy. But then there's planes trying to put the flames out with, you know, the chemicals. And, um, you know, your drone is interfering with things. So it can, you know, pretty much tell you where you can use it, why you can't use it today, and blah, 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 blah. So if people have a drone, you could be helpful and say, you really should get this smartphone app. Um, and from a personal injury standpoint, if you do have a camera on it and take videos or pictures, you know, and post them, I hope it's not with maliciousness in, you know, because knowledge that the act would violate the rights of another and would inflict personal injury can be excluded but you just posted stuff and you weren't really looking and then somebody says oh look at that that person's naked and then you know you'd have to explain that you really didn't put it you know on facebook for that reason if you look at all the other people around they were at the party for my daughter's you know birthday party so um, and then certainly you, you get a photo and then you Photoshop it. Well, now you're doing something intentional. Yeah. Okay. And of course, ISO has now recanted their, their way of putting covers back in the policy. So now they've created endorsements. And these are endorsements I don't want to see on my homeowner's policy should I have a drone. Aircraft liability definition revised to remove exception from model or hobby aircraft. So now aircraft liability means, and aircraft means any contrivance used or designed for a flight, including but, not including but not limited to. So there's no exception for not designed to carry people or property. So now no coverage. And we have another one for <gasps> personal injury. So we've created endorsements to take coverage away. Commercial lines created endorsements to give coverage back. We created endorsements to take coverage away. So if my insurance, do I know what kind of toys my insurance owns? Only if you talk to me every year is an insured necessarily going to call up and say, I just spent $4,000 for a drone. Maybe yes, maybe no. But I might want to make sure I know. And for you people out there in video land, I just want you to do this is your third, three, third. You haven't missed any. Ew, that thing's a pain in the neck. Chicken. Okay. So you have to minimize your screen, type in your name, bam. And then a thank you will appear, I guess, and that will be three, just three. This is just the third one. Just three. No, you haven't missed one. No, I didn't do one right after lunch to try to make you not get your CE. I don't work that way. Okay, I work for you, as the saying goes. So we don't want to see these endorsements. They were created in 2017. 
they are approved for use in Massachusetts. Does a company have to use them? No. So whenever a policy <coughs> gets renewed, do, do your companies, like I'm on a renewal basis, company hasn't changed edition dates, do they send me the whole policy with all of the policy language every year? No. But if they add something or change something, do they send me a copy of that endorsement? Yes, they're required to by law in Mass and New Hampshire also. That if something changes, they have to let me know. And so if it's a 2014 endorsement, they accept it in 2014, do they have to send it to me again next three years? No, you get it once, you attach it, and if you lose it, that's really too bad. So this would be something you'd be seeing if the companies choose to use it. Okay, page 72. Buying a home. Getting sick of apartment living. And the insured says, hey, why is the limit of insurance different from what they are paying for the house? And the bank says, why is the limit of insurance different from what we are mortgaging? That's probably where the discussion will come from. Um, ordinance of law, you all selling that? I think it's a darn good idea. Yes, I do. Especially, well, especially in New England. But anywhere, and even on a brand new house. So, page 73, market value. I don't care what you paid for that house. I really don't. I don't care if your mother gave it to you for a wedding present. What you paid for it is immaterial. Market value just means, you know, what somebody will pay for it. And a bank, from that standpoint, before they loan you money, do they pay somebody to do a comp and an appraisal to make sure they're not loaning way too much based on what other comparable houses in the area sell for? I don't care what it sells for. I care about when you have a loss to it, what we have to do for repairs. And I, you know, being in insurance in the 70s, I remember gas lines when I was in college. Even in odd days, yay. I remember when gas doubled in price. Of course, I remember it again in Katrina, after Katrina, but still. Um, and in the 70s, people, you know, oil got really expensive, and big old houses really tanked from what anybody could sell them for. And people would pay 70000 for a house, and then back in the 70s, we'd say, oh, and we're going to insure it for 275000 they say, what? I only paid 70000 for it. Well, I don't care. That's because it's got 14-foot ceilings and no insulation, and to heat that sucker is more than you make in a year. That's why it got devalued. But when it burns to a ground or it's seriously damaged, it's got wainscoting all around all the walls and all this chair rails and all this very expensive molding because it was built in the early 1900s or late 1800s because you live in Haverhill. And we're on Merrimack River, and we had a lot of merchants' homes, which now you can get for a song and a dance. But when they were new, they were magnificent, and that's what we're paying to replace. Well, I don't care. It really doesn't matter. Those of you that deal with MPIUA and have older homes, I hear they have hefty valuations. Is that true? But I also hear... That's because when they have a loss, we have to put the wainscoting back, correct? If they've got plaster ceilings and plaster walls, we don't put sheetrock up. That's what I hear. I tell you, sheetrock is cheaper than plaster. You, you disagree. So, oh well, I don't care what you paid for. It's immaterial. Now, banks, on the other hand, um, they think, well, the mortgage for that home is 500000 and you want to give me a limit of insurance of 300000 and that is just not acceptable to us. Have you had that problem? And again, I say, I don't care what's acceptable to you. Thanks for copies of the um, MSB that you calculate out the placement cost of. I know. If it's not equal in what they, See, banks... 
Their mortgage includes what? Land. And location. Location, location, location. You know? A location overlooking the ocean costs more from a market value standpoint than the same house located out in the boonies, correct? Could be the same house built by the same builder, the same year, same materials. And one you pay a million dollars for, the other one you pay $200,000 for, same house. It's all about land and location. And we don't, we don't insure land. In fact, we specifically say we don't do land under coverage A and we don't do land under coverage B. Under coverage A, the dwelling, the only thing we don't cover is the land on which the house sits. Everything else to do with that house we cover. And we don't cover uh, other structures, land. And location, does location influence the replacement cost? Yes. Yes, it can. But not to the extent it influences market value. I mean, labor out in the boonies might very well be cheaper than labor in a more metropolis area. And I was astounded one year when um, I get a Home Depot ad, and I'm living out in the boonies, and I'm teaching in Springfield, which is more urban than where I live. I said, well, I hate paying sales tax. I really do. I live in New Hampshire. Live free or die. No sales tax. Yay. I have to really want something to buy it in Massachusetts. And I grew up in Haverhill, again, on the border. If you were going to buy something that in involved sales tax, you just went over the border to Plasto in New Hampshire, pff, no sales tax there. You people on the Cape, you've got a long way to go to avoid sales tax. But, you know, I, yeah. so I think, well, I'm in Springfield and I really want it and I don't want to wait, so I'll buy it. And when I got there, it costs more. And I had the flyer with me. And the person said, if you look at the flyer, it's got a zip code on it. And even Home Depot doesn't charge the same rate. I didn't realize that. So location can influence price, but not to the extent market value does. But in Massachusetts, we have a law that the banks can't ask. If they write more than, where is it, five or nine? So not require, well, maybe I didn't put the whole thing, that they can't require more than the replacement cost of the buildings. And, you know, in New Hampshire, in excess of the value of the buildings on the real property. And in Maine, I didn't give you all of these, but if you need them. No. Oh, no, I did a check-in. Yes, I did. Yes, Leo, I did. Keep in track of me. That's good. I haven't done the sign-in for you guys yet. That we'll get to. Um, and in Maine and in Connecticut, actually the only state in New England that doesn't have a law is Vermont. I guess banks are friendlier there. I don't know. So if you need, and I even have the New York one. If you need it in any other state, let me know. I can send it to you. Rhode Island. Oop, excess up. So um, they're not supposed to ask me. So then when you tell them, this is a value, then they want the copy of the valuation. Can you send that? I mean, are you supposed to send that? <laughs> she said, probably not. I mean, technically, again, I'm, I don't care. It's not my problem. Technically, that's proprietary information owned by whom? The insurance company. No, not the insured. It does not belong to the insured, nor does claims information belong to them either. It belongs to the insurance company. So technically, I should be asking the insurance company. Just saying. I don't really care. But technically, it's not yours and it's not the insured's. But if I do send it with or without the insurance company's permission, I would send it with a disclaimer stating that this valuation is based on company XYZ software evaluation, the questions asked by company, and the answers given by the insured. Because I ain't guaranteeing anything. The only guarantees in life are what? Death and taxes. Insurance does not influence that at all. So I would do it with a little disclaimer, just saying. Because if you ask me what our house is made out of, you ain't getting what 
the value of that house is. I just give the phone to my husband. I have no clue. I don't know, nor do I care. So he's the one that knows that stuff. It's a house. I walk inside. I you know, open the door with the key. Yay, here I am. I know I have hardwood floors. I didn't know there were 75 kinds of hardwood floors to have. I don't know what they are. So you need to ask somebody that knows what they're doing. And that would be my husband and not me on that ilk. How many of you use tax assessor information? That's only one thing. You don't just use it, correct? No, no, no. Good. Because, you know, I can guarantee you. Oh, I know. they're. If we're talking about Irene and Bud's house, they're always wrong. I have yet to have a brand new house. Never owned a I slightly used or gently used, as the saying goes. And so when, when you put in the construction date and the type of house, unfortunately, since I left Havel, everything I've owned is a raised ranch, for crying out loud. I so wanted the basement the last time we moved. I don't know why, other than I haven't seen one since 1993. I wanted a house with a basement. Did not happen. So when you put in the type of house and the construction date, doesn't that company software automatically go bing, 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 and come up with a value, which is average. And I don't care. Houses after the 70s always put some wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in. And I don't have wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in my house because my husband's a cat lover and I'm a dog lover. I'm a hypoallergenic dog lover. And there is no such thing as a hypoallergenic cat, unless you get the hairless ones, and they're ugly. So we don't have them. <laughs> then you have to have the heat on at 9,000 degrees, and I die. So I have a Bichon Frise, which is hair. I need a dog with hair, not fur. Um, so every time we go in, if there's wall to wall carpeting, out it goes. And my husband has this belief in life that what the tax assessor <laughs> doesn't know. I know we record things, but they don't ever go anywhere. <laughs> um, so and if we do things on the outside of the house, he gets building permits. We do things on the inside of the house, ain't nobody got to know what we're doing. So it's a base, like you say. And then you have to ask me what it really looks like. So, um, I, and so I, I, I send it along with a disclaimer. But we don't do land. All that, you pay for that. You mortgage that, but we don't insure it. So. That's going to be a big chunk of change. Even if you have a little teeny lot, if that little teeny lot's overlooking the ocean, poof, that land got very expensive. So we don't do that. Nope. No, we don't. Um, so MGL 183, alienation of land. They can't ask for more than. Shall not. So I don't care what they say they think they can do. They can. It's against the law. That used to shut them up, but... If it's, and if we're arguing about $20,000, are you going to, no. But when you know they want the mortgage insured, then I'm going to argue about it. Because, now, now they're not just asking for a replacement cost, do they still ask for guaranteed? It's like, see, you never should have put that on the binder 30 years ago. Because it's rude the day since. Um, how many companies still have a guaranteed replacement cost? I know Andover does, right? Do they give it on every home? Not on old ones, I bet. Any other companies still have a guaranteed replacement cost endorsement? Pure? Safety? Woo. They still use the word guaranteed. Wow. That almost puts fear in me when I hear guaranteed and replacement cost in the same sentence. Um, I don't know what it is, but I can't put it on, I shouldn't put it on the binder if the insurance company doesn't have one, correct? And technically, the bank can't ask for it because the law only says replacement cost, not guaranteed replacement cost, so they have no right to ask for it, and I can report them to the bank and commission. It'd be nice if I had it, but. And, you know, from a standpoint of an insurance agent, I have to fight that you want the mortgage insured. 
And again, if I have to send the software an evaluation and I didn't get an okay from the company, I want to be very careful about my disclaimer. I'll send it, probably. <gasps> Not that I'm saying that. Um, but, you know, when you value somebody's house, if you put the same information in five different companies, you get the same value five times? So do you ever know what the value of, a, of anything is? No, you don't. It's that company's guesstimate, really. That's all it is. I never know. I said, this company says. And I'd, I'd end with, you know, do you feel this is enough? Because I don't know. I do not know. I have no guarantee that house burns down the ground that this is enough insurance. Do not know that. I might argue that some companies overvalue, but I don't know that either. Do we pretty much always add an endorsement of some type? to give them more insurance during the policy period than shows on the declarations page. Yeah, I think we do. I think. In my day, it used to be called Inflation Guard. Anybody remember the Inflation Guard endorsement? It still exists, but y'all don't sell it. Because theoretically, there's no inflation anymore. You used to have to pick a percent. Now we give you two different options, pretty much. So. Um, <coughs> our homeowner's policy pays losses if we insure to at least 80% of value, which should always happen, if you've talked to me at least in the last few years. And pretty much this is where we are. The replacement cost of that part of the building damaged with material of like kind and quality. Massachusetts, this is the ISO language, essentially 91, 2000, 2011. And we value the house based on where it's located today. But can I replace elsewhere. I mean the ISO language says you bought it, you live on 10 Green Street in Winthrop, Mass. That's how we value the rebuilding cost. But as far as ISO is concerned, you can take it and build your brand new house in Florida. That's ISO. Massachusetts doesn't have that same warm fuzzy feeling. It says your tax dollars are not leaving the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And whether it's the 91, the 2000, or 2011, our state mandatory endorsement, which all companies have to utilize, pretty much say, okay, we'll rebuild. You can rebuild other than in Winthrop, but you won't get replacement costs unless you rebuild where? Massachusetts. That's, we modify it. Um, reading this, it says, this is a lost settlement provision, correct? about replacement costs. As long as you carry 80%, we pay like kind and quality. Life is, you know, we're not talking ordinance of law yet. Um, and we pay replacement costs if you replace within the Commonwealth of Mass within two years. Well, I guess one insured, can there be some disagreement between insurance companies, contractors, and building inspectors? <laughs> Can they, I mean, of course, Irene. Can it take time to get the building permit to begin with? Yeah. Then you got the argument between the town, the, you know, the company, the contractor. And what authority, authority does the insured have in all this? None. Absolutely none. So I guess it took like two years and two months <laughs> to get everything done. And then the adjuster denied the claim. I said, and the agent said, can they do that? No, they can't. They're misreading this provision. Does this say you don't have coverage after two years? No, it says we don't have to pay replacement cost if you don't replace in, in the Commonwealth of Mass within two years. And shame on that company if you're just barely over the two years. Shame, shame, shame. Shame. I can't say shame enough. Shame. <laughs> no, I, it just depresses me when we look at why we don't have to pay claims in an insurance policy because that's not what it was designed to do. Take your money and do nothing. No. And when, I, when I'm the innocent bystander praying to get back into my house and getting it repaired, and they say, oh, we don't have to pay the claim at all. Oh, puh. And even invoking the replacement cost provision when it's barely over two years and it was not my fault. 
No. Okay. Where are we going? I don't know. I got off on my tangents. <sighs> Be still my heart. So I can replace anywhere in Massachusetts. Okay. Bam. Um, I oh, taught in, um, where was I this summer? Oh, New Mexico. And this guy was also an agent for California. I, lucky we don't have this. Ooh. Knock on wood. We, do, we live in a part of the country that really doesn't appear to have widespread destruction, correct? Some of us lamented at lunch that we're agents on the Cape and that goes up and down as two other companies want to insure down there. They're all, you know, they, they deal with these, comp these mathematical models that just guess when the big one cometh. Well, when was the last horrible hurricane in New England? Gloria. I mean, that was, what, in the 30s for crying out loud? I mean, really. Do we have, hur we have Northeasters that are worse than some of the last hurricanes that we've had. Bob. Bob. That, that, and that's the one they said. But that was, I mean, we've had Northeasters worse than that. So, they, come on. We are getting tornadoes. People remember tornadoes 30 years ago? I don't. We're getting them now. But we don't have wildfires. Because actually we have water and rain out here and we can actually put a fire out. Um, but if you had widespread destruction, that limit of insurance that seemed so good at the beginning of the policy year, can it be totally off of what happens now? If you have widespread destruction, does it cost more to fix things? Yeah. That's American greed. That's capitalism at its best. Yay. And unfortunately, other parts of the country have, have that more than we do. But you never know. And so we try to, you know, deal with that. So on page 76, if a company has a guaranteed replacement cost endorsement, I'd like to see it just to see what they're saying these days. This is ISO's answer to guaranteed replacement cost. Because we don't like that word guaranteed. It's like all risk. Like, what does that mean? You. Guaranteed. You. We have additional, oh no, that, this is not it, sorry. Next one, specified additional amount. This is what I call glorified inflation guard. Because back in my day, you'd pick like 8% or 10% or 12%. I remember 12% inflation. Hey. Um, this, you get like what, 1.25, 1.50? So it increases the amount, but it only increases coverage A. And if there's a serious problem, and you have another structure, wouldn't that cost more to rebuild too? And wouldn't your contents cost more to replace too? So this just, this makes a bank happy because they don't really think about the rest of the structures and they sure don't care about your contents. So it's additional amount, it's glorified inflation guy, 1.25, 1 1.50. Um, you, you, you have to start with the company value. If you don't like what they spit out and want less than that, you don't qualify for this. At least that's the way the ISO endorsement reads in the, the uh, rule. And pretty much if you start to muckle around with your house during the policy period and you put more than 5% of coverage A in it, what are you supposed to do? Call us, because if you don't, you just voided the endorsement. Not the policy, the endorsement. But it could shut the bank up. Does it shut the banks up? Because you put specified additional limit on 1.50. Here, I can show you the math. Does it make you happy now? I don't know. Yeah, but it, and it doesn't do anything with ordinance of law. It still has the same replacement cost. Replacement cost of that part of the building damaged with like kind of quality. What you had is what you get by new. And if it ain't broke, we don't fix it. Which banks don't always understand. This is ISO's answer to guaranteed replacement cost. Additional limits of liability. So it's a premium to get it. ISO suggests 15%. That's a lot of money. And then, you know, you've got to use their value, whatever the value is. And again, if you muckle around the house, you've got to tell us. But what it does is, if during the policy period you need to activate it, we actually endorse the policy. So if it started out at 100,000 and then, and that was right, but then you had that tornado rip through and it got a bunch of, you know, area in its path, 
And now, because there's not enough contractors to go around to rebuild my house costs 150000 do I have 150000 in coverage A? Yes, I do, because I got whatever you need. And then you physically endorse the policy. So if you endorse the policy, what's that going to do to B, C, and D? Increase them. So this is, you know, it could be worthwhile. It just costs more. It gives me what I need for coverage A, not ordinance of law, same materials. But it gives me whatever I need to rebuild as it was. And then it increases B because if, it co if I have a separate garage and it costs more to rebuild my house, won't it cost more to rebuild my garage? Yeah. I get 10% of a higher limit. Hopefully that will be enough. And more contents. Oh, it costs more. And I have no idea what your company specific endorsements do, but not my problem. And speaking of that, Ordinance of Law, let's take a break because you've been paying attention for 55 minutes. How good is that? See you in 10.